So today's topic is human purpose without exception. We have two speakers tonight, um, Serena Dykeson and Melanie Garcia. Serena, at the age of 13, found out she was pregnant, forcing her to make some big choices that would impact the rest of her life. We'll hear more about her story and in her encounter with God that led her to her position in ministry, inspiring others by teaching them worth and unconditional love in Christ. Melanie is a program manager at St. Joe County Right for Life. Both in her personal life and work life, Melanie is committed to empowering people to share the gospel of life and defend the unborn with grace and reason. She also would like you and all to know that she is a huge Lord of the Rings fan and will be quoting Tolkien. So I'd like to introduce them to you. Just needed to drop that name and, you know, that's all I need to do. But the only thing I liked, um, no, I like talking about Lord of the Rings better than I like talking about abortion, but it's close. Um, <laughs> so I'm so glad Theology on Tap invited Serena and I to talk on human purpose and dignity and abortion because these topics have really been in the news and in discourse lately um, with the, um, for a couple of reasons, um, especially certain laws being passed. Um, and I think it's important when we have these conversations with people about abortion and other topics that we're able to share truth. And that's kind of my prayer for this evening is that Serena and I are able to share some truth with you and um, you'll be able to um, transmit that to others. So probably the main reason that abortion has been in the news and in social media discussions so much in the past couple of months is because certain states are taking, uh, are passing radical laws on abortion on both sides. On the pro-choice side, we have states like New York, Illinois, and Virginia that have passed pro-abortion legislation that codifies abor abortion rights and among other things, strips protections from children born alive from botched abortions, lifts restrictions on late-term abortion, um, allows public funding for abortion, and in the state of Illinois, legalizes the barbaric practice of partial birth abortion. On the flip side, we have the more conservative states, um, such as um, Georgia and Ohio, passing bills that directly challenge Roe versus Wade. Um, Georgia and Ohio have passed um, heartbeat bills, which ban abortion when a fetal heartbeat is detectable. Um, arguably, though, the most controversial bill was passed in Alabama, the Human Life Protection Act. This bill essentially bans all abortion, with only an exception when the life of the mother is um, supposedly in jeopardy by the pregnancy and when a fetus is terminally ill and won't survive outside the um, mom's womb. Um, the bill d um, pointedly does not include a rape and incest exception. Um, a rape and incest exception means that um, victims of rape and incest can seek an abortion when other members of the population um, are prohibited from doing so. And this type of exception is pretty mainstream for even pro-life legislation. Um, illustratively, the Georgia heartbeat bill includes the exception for rape and incest victims. Um, and many pro-life politicians who actively support pro-life legislation um, say, I'm pro-life except in the case of rape and incest. So I believe that people, those people who have suffered that may have an abortion. Um, you've probably seen in the media and lots of politicians um, and on many social media conversations um, saying that the Alabama law is unjust and inhumane. A woman who has experienced um, sexual assault has been gone through such trauma that it's inhumane to force her to carry her rapist baby. I've also heard people argue in support of these laws that with abortion legal, thousands of unwanted children will come into the world and be born into poverty, um, abuse, end up in the foster care system, or if they have a disability, just be born into a life of suffering. Um, now, I think many people who make these arguments, it truly comes from a place of compassion, um, but compassion, like most things, can be misguided. The title of this talk is Human Purpose Without Exception. 
And we, um, as the Catholic Church, as the pro-life movement, believe that every human being, whether it's the three-week-old embryo whose heartbeat has just started, or the woman who's disregarded her church's values and has become pregnant, or the old woman um, who has severe dementia, no matter what, each of us has infinite um, dignity and purpose given to us by our Creator. Um, as Saint Pope John Paul II the Great, got to get all those titles in there because he's just that awesome, wrote in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae, or the Gospel of Life, man has been given a sublime dignity based on the intimate bond which unites him to his creator. In man there shines forth a reflection of God himself. All of us, no matter what, reflect the image and likeness of God. We all have infinite dignity and purpose, no, except, no exceptions. When we argue that abortion should be legal in cases of rape and incest or poverty or disability, we're essentially telling people who were conceived in rape or are disabled or are poor or have been abused or in the foster care system that their life has no purpose, that they essentially should never have been born. It would have been better if they had never been born. Our approach as the Catholic Church and as the pro-life movement to people who are suffering from poverty or have been conceived and raped or have been raped should not be to eliminate the sufferer, but to alleviate suffering while upholding the human dignity and purpose of that individual. How does this apply to a woman who has been raped and gone through just that unthinkable trauma? When we as a society, and a society, especially the media, essentially does this, tells a woman, woman who has been raped that abortion is her best option, we're essentially telling her that we don't really care enough to really help her. This is the easy way out for us, and we're taking the easy way out because we really don't want to deal with the actual problem. Serena will elaborate on this a little bit more, but studies show, empirical data shows, that um, abortion does not help women who have been raped. It actually makes the wounds of rape worse. In a study by Dr. David Reardon, 70 he found that 73% of rape victims choose life, and they were able to find healing through that sacrificial bearing of their child. Their child, um, another note, Alabama just passed a law taking away uh, parental rights from rapists. Um, this is a really good step in the right direction of bringing real healing to women who have been raped and who um, choose life. Um, continuing, the same study found that 88% of women who were raped and chose abortion um, regretted their decision. These women were at a higher risk for murder by suicide, or excuse me, for death by murder or suicide, drug overdoses, depression, and addiction. Abortion does not solve the problems of rape because abortion, like rape, is an act of violence against an innocent victim. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote in The Lord of the Rings that we cannot meet revenge with revenge. This heals nothing. We cannot meet the violence of rape with the violence of abortion. We can't meet the injustice of poverty with the injustice of abortion. We can't meet the suffering and challenges that often afflict those who have disabilities by eliminating the disabled person. We, as the Catholic Church and the pro-life movement, must respond to people, anyone who is suffering, with concrete support and love. And the truth is, we already do that in a lot of cases. Um, to cite just one example, so when um, the New York law was passed, a lot of people um, spoke out in support of the law, saying that um, the, the late-term part of the law that lifts restrictions on late-term abortion, saying that... It's a sympathetic thing to do to a couple who's experienced a difficult um, prenatal diagnosis, whether it's spina bifida or Down syndrome or a terminal diagnosis. It's the sympathetic thing to do to have an abortion. So society is essentially telling these parents who certainly are going through a difficult time, we'll help you. We will help you by helping you kill your child. That's not what real support looks like. Um, contrastly, um, so in our local Catholic diocese, we're blessed to have the Ministry of Miriam's Blessing. Um, it's a relatively new ministry, but um, basically the model is that they'll pair parents who receive a difficult prenatal diagnosis with a peer minister who will walk them through every step of making a plan for their child's unique challenges. If the child has a terminal diagnosis, they will... Um, 
help them make a plan for mourning and memorializing their child. That's what real support in the case of difficulty looks like, and we're fortunate enough to have a Catholic church and pro-life movement that supports people in that. Um, and that type of support, that, um, that upholds the unique purpose of those parents and that child. And that needs to extend um, unconditionally, um, even to people who might not be doing the right thing. Um, Serena and I are both sidewalk counselors at um, the abortion clinic, and we reach out to women who are going into their seeking an abortion. And we're trained to tell women, we will help you no matter what. So obviously we're not condoning their decision to have the abortion, but if they have the abortion, we're still going to be there to support them because having an abortion or making any kind of mistake, that doesn't, that doesn't take away that unique dignity and purpose you have as a child of God. Um, we refer women to, we're fortunate enough to have two local ministries, A Haven for Healing and then Project Rachel. Project Ra Rachel is a nationwide um, ministry sponsored by the Catholic Church. Um, surprisingly enough, um, religious people, um, not just secular people, have abortions almost at the same rate. So if you or someone you know has had an abortion or been involved in an abortion, I encourage you to, outre to reach out to one of these ministries. I have more information on them if you're interested. They, working with both of them in my position at Right to Life, they just offer beautiful, um, unconditional support and healing to men and women who, both men and women who've been hurt by abortion. Um, and if you believe that God loves you less or loves a loved one less because they've had an abortion, think of the parable of the lost sheep when there was such rejoicing in heaven when God reconciled that one lost soul to himself. I guarantee you that you or anyone you love who has had an abortion will be welcomed by the pro-life movement, by the Catholic Church, and most importantly by Christ himself with open arms and unbelievable love and healing. Um, so... Those are my claims. I'm, I have an English degree, and I was taught that you need to make a claim or a thesis, and then you provide evidence and examples. So I'm going to introduce my example, which is Serena and her beautiful story. Um, uh, I've been working with Serena the past several months on sidewalk counseling and other pro-life activities, and I don't know if there's anyone who inspires me as much as she does. She, I first encountered her when she messaged Right to Life's Facebook page, sharing her deeply personal testimony and just, you know, taking a huge risk and trusting that with strangers. I mean, she didn't know he was going to see that, but her passion for helping women is so strong that she was willing to take that risk. Um, and I'm sure you'll be as inspired by her as I am. Um, you're privileged because this is one of her first speaking engagements. I think one day she'll be a great pro-life speaker like Abby Johnson or Ryan Bomberger. So you have bragging rights in being here tonight. You'll get to say one day, I was at one of Serena Dykeson's first presentations. So uh, let me introduce Serena. Oh, goodness, girly girl. Um, thank you guys for coming tonight. I'm so excited that you guys are here and I'm literally standing on my tippy toes. I'm 4'10", so this is like cracking me up. Um, I, I just, um, something that I laugh about is I always told, when I got radically saved, I told the Lord that I would do anything he asked me to, but I said, don't ask me to speak. <laughs> and you know what? He doesn't, he doesn't want us to be comfortable, so here I am. <laughs> Speaking. So thank you guys for being here. I also want to thank Sean for being being here. I love his heart and his passion. I am just so blessed that I got to meet him. So thank you. And also Melanie, like thank you so much. Um, when Sean asked me to speak and he wanted me to talk about the law, I was like, I love people well. I don't talk about laws, but I can love people well. So I'm so thankful for you. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm Serena Dykeson, and I'm um, married to Bruce Dykeson. He's um, sitting right back there. Can you wave? <laughs> um, we've been married for 26 years, and we have two grown children, and I'm a nana, and I love being a nana. It is the best thing in the world. Um, we have attended Napanee Missionary Church for the last eight years. I love doing street ministry. Um, the Lord has taken me to uh, the roughest neighborhoods in our community to love on uh, drug addicts, pimps, and prostitutes. Um, I also volunteer at the 
Elkhart County Jail as a uh, jail chaplain and um, recently got involved with the right to life as a sidewalk counselor. So that's just a little bit about myself. And before we go any further, I would love to pray if we could just take a minute to just bow our heads and pray, and I would love to do that. So, Father God, I just thank you for this evening, and I thank you for what you're going to do tonight, and I thank you that we will lay ourselves aside and that we will prepare our hearts for uh, to be moved by you, Father God, and I thank you that you have brought each and every person here safely. Lord, you know every single hurt that is in this room, and I thank you that you are a healer and a redeemer. And Lord, I thank you that you know our hearts, and Lord, I thank you that we will just lay our agendas aside and that we will take up your agenda, Father God. I thank you for being our hope and our future and loving us in our brokenness. And I just thank you, Lord, for being here, and we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight I have been asked to speak on human purpose without exception, and it is my prayer that after you hear my story that you are a church that says I am pro-life no matter the circumstances, that um, you know that we just have an amazing God that redeems and restores, and that um, I'm, just, I'm just excited that Sean even asked us to talk about this because it's not something... I know our church talks about a lot. I have to say, my Catholic friends, you guys are awesome. Like, you guys are talking about uh, abortion and healing, and I'm just, I'm, I'm super blessed by that because that doesn't help happen a lot in my own church. So that's pretty amazing. Um, how many of you guys saw the movie Unplanned? So quite a few of you. Okay, so I have to be honest, I don't watch TV, and I'm not a movie watcher. I'm not, I just don't, and I did not know anything about the movie Unplanned, except for someone on my social media said this is a must-see movie, and I was like, okay, I love supporting Christian movies, so I'm going to go see it. And it was during that movie that um, when Abby Johnson was at the fence, and she was sharing the importance of protecting life, is when I heard the Holy Spirit say, now's the time to tell the rest of your story. And so um, I recently came across a quote that says, your story is the key that can unlock someone's prison. Don't let it rust. And I had been carrying a part of my story, a rusted key that I knew that the Lord wanted to use. And so I... Um, so one night I was with a group of friends, and we were sitting around, and I just shared my story. And one of my friends, she said, you have to tell the rest of your story. So I wrote it down, and I wasn't sure what the Lord wanted to do with it, but I knew he wanted to use it somehow. And so I reached out to Right to Life, and you're going to laugh. I had no idea really what Right to Life did. I, had, I didn't know about their organization. <laughs> That's just how the Lord works. And so... Um, I reached out and I just simply asked, do you guys love on go to abortion clinics and love and pray on women? I didn't, I didn't know pray with women, not pray on women, pray with women. <laughs> we don't want to pray on, <laughs> ha. Anyway, so, um, so it was just, it cracked me up because I had no idea. And so then I, I started talking to Melanie and I shared my story and she, she actually offered to give me a platform to share my story. But at that time, I was like, mm, I don't know if I want the community to know my story. <laughs> and so I just really started pressing in and praying. And I felt like the Lord said, you know, now's the time to share your story. You need to trust me. And so I did. Um, during that time, she also shared that they were going to do sidewalk counseling. And anybody that knows me knows that I love people. And so I was all in. I was just all in. I'm like, sign me up. And so I started sidewalk counseling. Also during this time, um, my schedule was completely cleared. Um, I was working for a ministry and they shut the ministry down. So I was like, all right, am I supposed to be moving towards the, the pro-life movement? I really wasn't sure exactly what was going on there. And uh, I, started, um, I started job hunting and, and the Lord just kept closing door after door after door. And one day I just kind of on my social media kind of vented a little bit of my frustration 
And through that, I got a message from a lady named Julie, and um, she actually is part of Teen Challenge Ministries, which I serve on a board, and I absolutely love their ministry. And she, her uncle actually started Teen Challenge Ministry, and we, um, I don't even know why, but I kind of shared my story, and she said, can I interview you? And I, of course, said yes. And it actually exploded. I was not anticipating, um, I was not anticipating my story to, sh to spread as fast as it did. And I've seen the Lord using it and women contacting me and reaching out and just a lot of healing happening. Um, so just a little bit, I'm, I'm just going to start my story. <laughs> so um, I grew up in a pretty dysfunctional home. We were pretty poor. We were unchurched. And a lot of times we would just, um, my parents couldn't pay their bills, we would move in the middle of the night and we would be on our way. And when I was about 11 years old, we had br briefly moved to North Carolina and moved back. We never stayed in one spot very long. And uh, we came back and um, my aunt had recently got married and she was asking me to babysit and I started babysitting for them and my my uncle started sexually abusing me, and by the age of 13, I had been raped, and I was pregnant. Um, I was in, actually, I had shared with someone on the bus, um, just, you know, when you move around a lot, you don't make friends easily, and so I reached out to, um, I actually reached out to someone, I shared what was going on, and I remember being in sixth grade choir, and they came to, to get me, and and uh, my, my parents were called, and we ended up going to the doctor, and of course, they gave me a pregnancy test. I was pregnant, and that was the first time I had ever heard the word abortion. I had no idea what that, I had no idea what that word was, and that was the only option that was given to my family. They didn't give any other options, and so um, I, I would later hear from my mom that the doctor Actually, um, they were making threats that they, that's what had to be done. And now being part of the, the pro-life movement, the abortion industry is pretty nasty, so I'm not surprised that that was happening. Um, we were told by the doctor that the people that are outside the abortion clinic, they would harass us and that they hated us. So to just make sure that we got into the clinic as fast as we could. And so on the day that we got to the clinic, um, there was actually no one outside the clinic. And um, to be honest, we were pretty stressed out at that point. And I can remember like a kind of a relief because I didn't even know what was going on. Um, now that I'm a trained counselor, I know that Planned Parenthood totally lied. That is not the truth. That's not what people do when they sidewalk counsel. They are not there to harass, and they don't hate the women going into the clinic. Um, once, once we got to the clinic, I was, mind you, 13 years old. I was taken back for a um, counseling session, which no 13-year-old should go back for a counseling session by themselves. Um, if anybody is ever wondering if Planned Parenthood plays by the rules, they don't. They don't care. Um, and so I was taken to this room for counseling, um, and honestly, I have no idea what they were talking about. The only thing I remember is them talking about a, a clump of cells and if I was ready to go for the procedure, and I just nodded because I had no idea um, what they were talking about. Once, um, once we went through the counseling session, I was put in the room for, for the abortion, and I remember the doctor just coming in and smiling and saying, this is not going to take long. And once he started the procedure, it was the most painful thing I had ever experienced, and I started screaming, and he, he shut that down pretty quick. He was not the kindest man, and um, a nurse did come and try to hold my hand and later I would find a journal that my mom wrote that she did hear my screaming the whole waiting room heard my screaming and she wanted to go back and they wouldn't allow her to go back 
Um, once the procedure was done, I was taken to a room full of women. They don't even allow you to have a personal room to recover. They just put you with a bunch of women in recliners. And I don't remember how long I was back there. Um, I do, once I got ready to leave, I stood up and blood just went everywhere and my dad had to carry me to the car um, because I was so weak. And I left the clinic a broken, busted kid that day. Um, and we never talked about the abortion, we never talked about the rape, we never talked about any of that. There was no counseling, no nothing. The next time that we, that I ever shared my story when I, I was 16, um, I became pregnant again, and, um, my now husband, we, uh, found ourselves, we had sex outside of marriage, and, um, he, he mentioned, what do you think about abortion? And that's when I found my voice to say, no, we're not going to have, we're not going to have an abortion. And he agreed. He had never heard my story and he heard my story for the first time. Um, I have to say it was pretty terrifying to go talk to his parents um, because he grew up in a Christian home. And so it was like, he knew better. And I, you know, like you just, that is an awkward moment. And they did not condone us being pregnant, but they met us with a whole lot of love and grace and mercy. And um, we also were just, we were just loved on really, really well by them. March 14th, 1993, we gave birth to a healthy baby girl. And um, three months later, we got married. We also, on that same day, my husband graduated high school. If you guys ever think that's a great idea, it's not. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> it was insane, but we made it work. Um, what I can tell you is that we were so blessed by the church. When I didn't know how to parent, there was always someone, some mom, that would help me in the church. Um, when we were broke as a joke, someone always had coupons or they always had something to help us out. When we needed a car, someone always came through and made sure that we had a reliable car in our budget. And, um, you know, that just so blessed us and made such an impact in our life that um, we now do that in our own home. We have an open door policy in our home and um, we just welcome people into our home because that just blessed us so much. Um, by the by the age of 23 we had two children and we had bought our first home and we thought we were beating the odds we thought we were doing great by 25 I had my first miscarriage which was very devastating and um, pretty much led to marital issues later on um, before I was 30 um, I my left ovary ruptured and I almost bled to death and lost my life and by 29, I had a complete hysterectomy, which um, due to reproductive issues, which um, we don't know if that is because of the abortion, but it's pretty common. Um, by middle school, when our kids hit middle school, we were hit by a crisis um, of our kids being abused by a close friend. And um, it became very clear that I had not dealt with my wounds and my life started spiraling out of control pretty quickly. Um, I started drinking every day. I was abusing prescription um, pain meds and uh, smoking marijuana whenever I could get it. And I had moved out of our house and we were headed to divorce. Um, and life was not very good at all. And um, one night um, after partying pretty hard, um, which I, I was doing pretty much every weekend, um, I had gotten pretty drunk that night and I was in um, a parking lot and I, I was in my car and I knew I was too drunk to drive and I started reaching out to my friends and after a while um, what you figure out is the people that you surround yourself with either they're consumed in their own garbage or you burn bridges pretty quick and I had done both. And so that night I was pretty desperate and I was pretty broken and I was pretty busted. And I ended up just crying out to the Lord because I, I didn't have anything else. That's, he was all I had. 
And uh, the Lord met me that night in my car in a pretty radical way, and I knew that I was loved, and I knew that he wanted to help me. And by God's grace, I made it, I made it home, and um, Bruce met me at the door and welcomed me in. From there, I started intense counseling and for my deep wounds. And let me tell you, it is not fun unpacking this stuff, but... Um, there were many times I would drive to my counselor's office and I wanted to drive right back out. I would make myself go in and I acted like a punk and I, would not, I was not very nice to him, but he was such a godsend to me. Um, he always met me with gentleness and kindness and love. And um, one day um, I was in my living room and I was still battling the whole bitterness and anger from the, the guy that had abused our children. And I, I just couldn't let that go. And the Lord just totally met me on that day. And he took me to Lamentations 3.55, uh, 3.55 through 58. And it said, I called your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near me when you, when you called and you said, do not fear. You took up my case and you redeemed my life. And it was that day that I knew that God had forgiven me and he had set me free from all the garbage that I was carrying, even to the, even to the extent of I went to go pick up a wine bottle and I couldn't even pick up my wine bottle that I had been drinking from every day. He set me free. He uh, restored my marriage and he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, restored the relationship with my children, and we have been so blessed to be able to welcome so many spiritual kids into our home, um, and I'm just so thankful for God setting me free on that day. As a post-abortive rape survivor, I want you guys to hear me loud and clear that abortion did not fix my rape. What women need for you guys to do is they need a whole lot of Jesus, a whole lot of Jesus. They also need a lot of support from you guys. They, um, they need people that are going to fight for laws to protect them from their attackers, and they need you to um, speak life and truth into them. Most, most people who support abortion after rape just have misguided compassion and mercy, in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And I love how the Lord says he declares it. And what I know about my God is he does not have flippantly do anything. And so he is pretty good at turning messy situations into beautiful stories. Um, I think... It's easy for, for people to say that rape is the worst thing that could happen to someone, but what they don't know is what women experience behind the doors of Planned Parenthood or abortion clinics. My abortion was traumatic. Um, they lied to me, they lied to my family, and they certainly didn't love me or care for me. Abortion only adds more pain and shame and guilt and keeps women in shackles. I am thankful that today I can walk in complete freedom from my past. I'm thankful that I'm able to talk about my healing. And a verse that has comforted me quite often is found in Genesis 50, 20. And it says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This is just a little part of my story that I thought I'd never talk about. There's, there's always this fear that people are going to look down on you. But what I can tell you is that that is a complete lie. I have met, been met with such love, grace, and mercy. And I know that I walk in complete freedom and healing and forgiveness. And if there's anyone in this room that has had an abortion, I encourage you guys to go for healing. You're going you're gonna to be loved and met with so much love and grace and forgiveness and um, freedom in your life. It is my prayer tonight that you guys walk away from here with a new perspective regarding the exception argument to abortion, that my story doesn't fall on deaf ears, 
that abortion, that you guys hear what abortion actually does to women, and that um, you guys see value, that God values every single person. He has, he has value for every single person, and that he is amazing redeemer, no matter the circumstances, that God is greater than our greatest ups and downs, and that you guys choose to give women a voice and you speak life to them, and you speak truth to them, and that you lead them, you point them to the cross. I am so honored that you guys had me here this evening, and this was just a small little snapshot of my life. I am currently working on writing a book, and I would love for you guys, if you guys want to read it, you can reach out to me. You don't have to. You can friend me on Facebook. I love new friends, um, and I can keep you up to date, but before I close, I just want to say to you guys, I want to encourage you guys to be proactive. You guys need to be proactive in reaching women before they even get to the abortion clinic. Because once they get to the abortion clinic, they've already been lied to. They've already been filled with fear. They are, they're in crisis. And so what I would suggest is you guys go to the neighborhoods, you, you share these resources, or if you're not comfortable with that, um, you can give money to local organizations to get information out. You can volunteer as a sidewalk counselor. Um, invite people into your home and just love on women. Um, and that is just some of the ways that you guys can be proactive in reaching women. And I just am so thankful for you guys and um, just thank you for having me this evening and hearing my story. And just God bless you guys. Thank you, Serena. I'm just going to wrap it up with talking a little bit more specifically about ways to get involved um, and the resources that we have in our community. Um, what I love about Serena's story is how her support network um, her church, her family, they didn't cast her out for violating um, her value, uh, their values. They, you know, they gave her concrete support and love, and I think that's truly a um, model for the pro-life movement. Um, because if we're going to pass radical pro-life legislation, like in Alabama and Georgia, we need to be there to provide radical support to women and families in crisis. It's not just enough to state that abortion is wrong. We need that it would be um, it would be unethical to leave people to struggle on their own, and we need to do that as a community and as individuals. Um, in our community, we're fortunate enough to have truly an abundance of local resources that support um, women in crisis, but also just families in general. Um, on your table, there should be a sheet with a list of four local organizations that provide support for women in crisis. Um, I've got Women's Care Center, of course. Hannah's House, St. Margaret's House, Sister uh, Marana Brocknick Health Clinic, um, which is a offshoot of St. Joe Health System. Um, I, ha I was asked to do this to highlight these resources and highlight specifically what they do because it's important as you're working with people in your lives to, be, uh, to know about resources in your community. So when somebody comes to you and needs help, you can point them exactly where to go. You know where to um, help them. At the bottom of that sheet, there's a link to hermichiana.org. Um, then there are Hermichiana cards on the tables, too. Hermichiana is a resource that we put together that um, lists over 200 resources in our community that offer services to women and families. At m most of them are free, but, some, but at very least they're low cost. Um, so please go to that website and familiarize yourself with those resources because it's really crucial that um, you know what to offer people. Um, because yes, we as a community need to provide support to women and families, and obviously public funding has a role, um, but all, like the four resources I have listed here are private organizations, so there's a lot we can do just as a local community in supporting women. Um, now, that's th it's not just enough to for a community to support. We as individuals can do so much to end abortion if we really step up and be a resource for people in our lives. Serena and I know from being at the abortion clinic that a lot of the women who go in there are only going in because they feel like it's their only other option. 
um, I um, had an encounter with a woman who um, called our office. She was, um, she was sitting in the parking lot of Planned Parenthood, and she had an abortion scheduled, and she told me, um, I don't want to do this, but I have four other kids at home, and I can't get child care. So I'm only doing this because I can't find child care for my kids, and I can't work if I don't have child care, and, you know, my husband's out of the picture. Um, and we were able to get her some child care, but it's really just emblematic of that most, most women don't, all women probably, don't want abortion. It's just something that they feel forced to do. Um, and we can do, community has a role, but we can do so much as individuals in just impacting the people in our lives. Not everyone's called to be a sidewalk counselor, um, but yeah, we really need them if you are called. You do feel called. Let me or Serena know. But not everyone's able or called to be a sidewalk counselor or pray at the abortion clinic or be a counselor at Women's Care Center. But everyone is called to love those around them and be supportive of those around them. And you can kind of live this holistic pro-life light in just little ways, like um, babysit free of charge for a single mom that you know. Um, when you go out shopping, make it a habit of like picking up one extra item to donate to a homeless shelter or um, a family in need you know or a pregnancy resource center. Um, um, when a new family, make a, f make a meal for a family with a newborn. Um, or even smaller than that, encourage, you know, when you see a mom in the store and her kids are acting up, you know, give her a word of encouragement. You know, say, you know, everyone has bad days. You look like you're doing a good job. I know that my mom always gets super embarrassed when that happens in public. Um, it means a lot if you just let somebody know that, you know, that you care. Be a good listener. Um, I get quite a few people call the office just asking for help, not even related to pregnancy or abortion. And they'll just talk to me for a really, really long time and spill out their deeply personal problems to a stranger. So people are really just looking for someone who cares. And we can do so much to end abortion. These legal battles are going to wage for a really long time probably. But we can do so much to end abortion in our community if we each commit to being a resource for the people in our lives. Thank you. I was just wondering, um, what are some concrete ways for a man to help women in these kind of circumstances? That's a really good question, um, because we get a lot of men who don't want to be involved because of the no to uterus, no opinion um, rhetoric. Um, well, we have lots of men who are sidewalk counselors. Mike Rommel, right there, he's one of our male sidewalk counselors. We had uh, five guys at our last sidewalk counseling training. So um, a lot of women um, who go into the clinic feel, you know, feel more secure talking to a guy, honestly. So if that's something that you're comfortable doing, we really encourage guys to go through our training. Um, because and it's not just talking to the women. A lot of the women who come in have men with them. And, you know, I can try and talk to them, but it really means a lot more coming to a guy, um, coming from a guy. So I know not everyone's comfortable doing sidewalk counseling, but if you're called to do that and you think being male is a barrier, that's BS. I, th I, really, thought, I really thought about dropping that, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> um, other ways that um, you can be involved in our organization, we always need people to pray at the clinic. Um, I know a lot of our female sidewalk counselors who are out there feel secure having a man out there. So even if you're just out there praying, that makes us feel really secure because, you know, um, we've gotten people swerving at our counselors and just shouting at us. So if you're a guy and you, you don't want to talk to people, but you just want to be out there praying, that, that's really, really helpful. Um, other ways you can get involved, um, just basically with our organization, um, we're really looking for people to serve on our um, abortion prevention task force, um, which would work on monitoring the clinic, kind of gathering data, so we're hopefully being able to shut them down. I feel like that could be a chant at a Trump rally, but it'd be one I could get behind. Um, <laughs> um, so if you're interested in that type of thing, we'd really like some strong men to be on that um, council. But um, as well, I just encourage you as a guy, don't be afraid to have conversations about abortion. If somebody tells you, you know, you can't talk about abortion, you don't have a uterus, you're a guy, don't be afraid to turn that back to them and say, well, isn't that sexism saying I can't have an opinion on a topic because of my sex? Um, 
I have found in conversations with people that turning their rhetoric back for them in a, in a charitable way can be really effective. So as a guy, don't be shut down by pro-choice rhetoric that says you don't have a voice because um, uh, men are a huge part of the issue. I mean, there's a man involved in every abortion. So don't be afraid to uh, speak out. Nobody else? I will get more specific and ask you. Um, I used to do this in class all the time. So what was one concrete way that somebody thought of to um, support the people in their life? Like, what's, like I listed a couple simple ways. What's a couple of reasons that people thought of, or um, ways that people thought of? Um, we were just talking about how going to events like this, um, informing yourselves, reading um, proper news articles, um, you know, different things like that that really kind of help to enlighten you about the issue. And then just being compassionate um, with how you're talking. Um, somebody at our table was just saying, like, you know, you should talk with somebody um, all the time just in the sense of, like, if they had ever been through anything like this before, you should talk with that kind of compassion and understanding and not necessarily just assume and have negative language within your talking points because you just don't know what anybody's been through. Yeah, that's a really great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we have, uh, we run a Right to Life boot camp every, uh, it usually it's in February, and we, uh, people will always ask, well, what about rape? What do you say when somebody brings that up in a conversation? And I see a lot of pro-life people do this, and it's really unfortunate. They'll say when presented with that, well, that's just, you know, that's less than 1% of abortions. Um, but we train people in our training to, if somebody asks that question, answer it as if, you know, you thought that that person or someone that they know had, a, had gone through a sexual assault. Because um, if you answer it with that compassion, you're going to build that repertoire, and they're much more likely to accept your answer than just saying, oh, you know, that's just one person, you know, that's less than one percent. Like, that's not compassionate. Um, the other thing you brought up about informing yourself is really important, too. Um, and concrete ways you can do that, um, follow us on social media, uh, St. Joe County, Right to Life. Follow Students for Life is a great Facebook page. Um, Lila Rose, Abby Johnson. Um, it's really important to know exactly what's been going on, especially with like this type of legislation. With all of the laws, I saw tons of people claiming that the Alabama law, they were going to criminalize women, give women the death penalty if they um, sought an abortion. Um, that's just not accurate. Um, we at Right to Life, we actually read through the whole law. It took a long time, but <laughs> we did it, and we kind of shared a fact sheet on our Facebook page. So just, you know, having a grain of truth like that, so when you're having a conversation when somebody brings up uh, a falsity like that and being able to share truth with them is really important. Um, we also have an email list if you go to our website, and I um, share one news story per broadcast email, which we only do every to one email every two weeks, so it's not too much. Um, but and oh, and we also have a library with lots of great pro-life books. Um, uh, I know when I first started out, it's really important. It was really important for me to be able to um, read pro-life literature, like *The Unaborted Socrates* by Peter Kreeft is a great one. Has anybody ever read that? I'm disappointed in you, Diego. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that those types of books, *Unplanned*. How many people have read *Unplanned*? Okay, well, we have copies of that in our library, so if you want to come check it out. They have it at the regular library, too. Um, but, yeah, just educate yourself, because when you're having conversations with people, um, Helen Navarre, who's one of the greatest pro-life communicators of all time, she says you need to know the footnotes of the footnotes if you're going to engage on this issue. You probably don't need to read footnotes of footnotes, but just starting with great books like Unplanned or The Unaborted Socrates or watching Unplanned and liking pro-life news sites, um, that can take you a big step in the right direction, being able to, you know, touch people with truth. So that was a very good question slash comment. What were other concrete ways that people thought of for defending life and helping people? So we talked about how we need to reach uh, children when they're younger 
because they're bombarded so much with uh, media and a very sexualized culture. So by the time they're in high school, they have already formed their opinions or have had false information fed to them. So I'm a middle school religion teacher, so I theology of the body. So um, this is a lot of stuff I teach to my middle schoolers and to help them see and be able to see the truth and uh, express the truth in a concrete way, which for a lot of them is the first time they've heard um, put in a way and helping them understand. So I think if we get to them while they're younger and help them see the truth, it will really help when they're faced with situations where they get older. Um, but how would you go about like maybe those who are indifferent? Because especially at middle school, you have a lot of indifference. <laughs> Um, I'm really glad you brought that up um, because one of my favorite ministries that Right to Life um, runs is um, our Life Team ministry where we go into local 8th grade classrooms and talk to kids about field development and introduce them to the topic of abortion. Um, and that's always really interesting because, I mean, most when we go into Catholic schools, you know, most of these kids have grown up pro-life, but they don't really understand the issue or even know what abortion is. So when it comes to um, shaking kids out of apathy, I mean, I talk about abortion. I talk about what it is. I don't show any graphic images, but I describe the procedure in a, in a relatively sanitized way, but I, I tell kids about it. Um, I, I was giving kind of the life team presentation to my younger sisters, um, and it really opened their eyes. I mean, my sister was like, there's no way that this is legal. This can't be true. Um, so I think it's important um, if we are going to take these preventative measures is to share the, share the truth with children. Don't be afraid um, if you deem that they're mature enough to handle it to give them the truth because the pro-choice movement is just going to start feeding them lies as soon as they get you know, in high school or college age. Um, when it comes to um, chastity education, um, right, St. Joseph County Right to Life doesn't really have a ministry with that, but I know the local churches do a really good job teaching theology of the body, which is so important. I love it so much. Um, but I think it's, um, it's we as, you know, Catholics, and obviously not everyone comes from a chastity background, to be open about sharing your personal testimony about chastity, because I'm sure everyone has one. Um, you, you know, some people are kind of taken aback, well, um, I don't have a testimony like Serena, but, which is, I'm really glad Serena um, is here able to share her testimony. Not that I'm glad that happened to her, but you get what I mean. Um, but, y you know, if you have a testimony about, you know, saving sex until marriage, that can be a really powerful thing to share with kids. Like, when I, you know, a young woman go into classrooms and I talk to kids and I talk about having a beautiful relationship with my boyfriend that isn't based on sex, like, that can be a really powerful witness. So don't be afraid to share, you know, your personal chastity story with children. Um, I think I answered your question. Was your question about apathy related to uh, other than children as well? Do you want me to hit on that? Okay. Um, when it comes to people who are apathetic about the issue, um, again, I think it's important to share the truth with them. With the abortion clinic being open, I've started talking to my pro-choice friends about what goes on at the clinic and how a lot of the women being there are clearly being pressured into having the abortion and some, a lot of them leave crying um, and they just clearly don't want to do this. And my friends say, I had no idea that this was the case. They were under the mindset that the pro-choice, you know, women go into abortion clinics because they want to exercise their, you know, constitutional right to choose. That's just not the case. And, you know, uh, share, you know sharing this with people, I, I see an opening for us to really share truth about you know, what happens at an abortion clinic, whether it's the abortion procedure or what women are going through. Um, when it comes to shaking people out of apathy, um, I think, you know, sometimes you have to get into the the, not the gory details, for lack of a better word, because um, that can really be helpful. Um, I know Unplanned um, was really effective in shaking pro-life people out of their apathy, because even if you're pro-life, some pro-life people are just happy to be... Um, armchair pro-lifers, but we got just such an uptick in people calling us wanting to volunteer after seeing Unplanned and seeing the truth of abortion and what it does to children and women. So when it comes to shaking people out of apathy, don't be afraid to 
don't be afraid to tell them the truth about abortion and what it does to kids and women. And if that comes to sharing graphic images, then I think there's certainly a time and place for that, especially in educational settings. To go a little bit further with that, we actually did have a young man stop at our fair booth that um, shared he, that he really appreciated, what's the program? Life team coming into his school. He knew that he valued life, but he didn't realize why he valued life. And um, I just want to encourage you guys as parents to, be have, to have those tough talks with your kids because our booth was in the same booth as Planned Parenthood, and let me tell you, they were targeting middle school kids. And so you guys have to be proactive. You have to have those tough conversations. And, you know, this young man was probably 16 and just said how much he appreciated hearing the truth. So I just want to encourage you guys with that. I just want to thank you uh, one more time for coming out here and sharing your story.